Well, hey there, and welcome to Understanding the Bible, and we are in the final week of this Bible study on Revelation. And in this week, we are looking at the last part of Revelation, chapter 21 and 22. This is the final study with me, and we're going to be exploring the beginning of this section, looking at Revelation 21, just reading it through fresh and seeing what we see. The kind of the challenge for this passage has been to um, explore how literal or symbolic this chapter is. So we're going to be looking at that in particular as we read through it today. So grab your Bible and let's dive in. All right, well, here we are in Revelation 21, and let's start reading. Oh, darn it, I forgot my coffee. I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. Hot. All right, let's get started. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first... See, I knew that. I needed that coffee. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. All right, so, so far, so clear. He's seen a vision of the of a new heaven and a new earth. He's seen that the um, old heaven and earth has passed away. Um, it's not radically clear right now if this term heaven is referring to what we're thinking of when we use heaven as kind of the spiritual place versus the sky or, um, you know, just what we would refer to as the sky. Let's, uh, let's take a look. Revelation 21, one interlinear. All right, and so here we have the word heaven, and it is singular, so not new heavens, but a new heaven, or a heaven, as it's described here. And let's um, click on the word to see more about it, so we can see how it's used. So here we have just a list of different places that this word is used, and we can see that it's often translated heaven, like looking up towards heaven, um, which probably means more of the sky, right? Looking up towards heaven. So we have all of this, um, and mostly it's translated as heaven throughout. Here in Luke, it's um, to the other part of the sky. So King James also used heaven. Um, We see a couple other places where it's sky in this as well. But mostly it always says heaven. Here we have to the sky, the sky opened. Um, And so it's a very common word used throughout. And so in English, we know that heaven usually is referred to as um, this kind of idea, not of the sky itself as the expanse, but rather as, um, you know, the place where God dwells. So let's look more about this word. So it's not clear just from all of these passages um, how much that distinction is made. So we're going to click on right here, the Strong's Greek for this 3772. Just um, this is a way of looking up the meaning of the word. And so you can see this is the word as a whole, and it can be, you know, um, conjugated in different ways. And so this page is going to tell us information about about the word. In this case, it's a noun, which we translate as heaven, right? And so... Um, one of the things we'll see here is that there it can be translated singular or plural, so heaven or heavens. And let's come down and look at the definition here. So this is just a lexicon. It's kind of like a definition of, um, of Greek words in this case, um, Greek or Hebrew and biblical studies. And so we've got... Um, it's coming from this idea of covering or encompassing, and it means, it's described as the heavens, um, heaven, and the heights, the upper region. So it's the vaulted expanse of the sky with all the things visible in it. And if you look at it, this, this makes sense, right? So you have earth and then the sky and stuff around it. So if God is recreating the world, making a new world, he's making a new earth earth and heaven, right? The, the, the physical land where we are and the sky above us. So it's all of the world is what this is saying. All right. So when we look at that and we read this, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Um, we should probably be reading that as 
um, that God is just making the whole world, you know, the part that we can live on and the part that we can see above us. And then it's also adding a reference to the sea here, a new heaven and new earth. The first heaven and earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And this is a bit of a cryptic thing. So it's like in the vision, what he's seeing is um, is just earth without the sea. What it, what exactly does that mean? Um, I don't know. I'm actually just going to highlight it in red and move on. That does seem like it would be interesting to see what people think of that. Why, why is there no longer any sea? And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. And we've uh, read about Jerusalem some so far. So the new city coming down out of the heaven, so out of the sky from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So the most cryptic thing here is how does a city look like it's prepared as a bride for the husband? I'm not sure what that would visually look like, um, but we understand the picture, right? This picture of Jerusalem, the city coming down from the sky to earth in in splendor, maybe, in purity, um, um, that just the, the, the majestic nature. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among the people, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. All right, and this first section is divided into two parts. There's the visual image, like what he sees, and then there is the explained message, what he hears. And I think the latter kind of gives us an understanding of what the former is. So if we're asking how symbolic is this, I think that the second part tells us um, what some of the symbolism means. So it's telling us that it is symbolic, and it's telling us what it's symbolic of. So this first part about new heavens and new earth, right? This vision of that happening, right? Of the old earth kind of being replaced by the new one. We actually have an explanation of that right here at the end. The first things have passed away. What it's telling us is at least the world as we know it is going to be replaced by a new world. So to some extent, it's not clarifying whether this is a whether there's any change physically to the earth, right? All of the descriptors here are about what it means to live on earth the way that we're used to, rather than about the physical nature of it. It doesn't say the trees are different. It doesn't say there aren't animals. It doesn't say those kind of things. The part that's being kind of more clear is telling us which elements are different. And those do tie into the vision. But I think when we see this element of a new heaven and a new earth, at a minimum we know However God does this, it's going to be a transformation that is so radical that the old things no longer are here. Things are completely new. And within this first vision, we have this idea of the holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down. Right? And so what does that mean? What does it mean that we have this vision of a new Jerusalem? I think as we literalize this, we think, okay, there's, God's going to make a new city and it's going to be called Jerusalem. And that's clearly not the idea that's happening. Now, could that be the method? Sure, that could also be the case. But what is being clarified here is not anything about a city. What's being clarified is the meaning of Jerusalem. And look how it's explained. Behold, the tabernacle of of God. Now, Jerusalem and the tabernacle are different things. So when you think about them literally, they are physically not the same. However, they are the same when you look at their meaning. Both the tabernacle and Jerusalem are kind of seen as dwelling places of God. That as you looked at Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, the place where the temple was, that this is the place you would go up to to meet and experience God as he was dwelling among you in a special way. There is symbolism in this for sure in both the tabernacle and in Jerusalem. Even in the Old Testament, it was very clear to everyone that God could not be contained in these small areas, that God was infinite, that God was everywhere. And yet these symbols, these places, were powerful reminders. 
that God gave to the people of Israel so that they would have an easier time experiencing, understanding, and even talking about the infinite God. And so the explanation here is that Jerusalem is God's presence, right? That Jerusalem as a city is the place where God dwells. And we see that right here. Behold, the tabernacle of God is among the people. And that's an important element of a city too, right? It's like where God dwells with people. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Now, this is taking the idea of Jerusalem. This is taking the idea of a tabernacle, and it's showing this played out in a special way. That God's people in this new world, in this new heavens, in this new earth, is going to experience God living amongst them and being his people in a full and complete way. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. These things are all sounding very clear. They're definitely not things that have happened now. It's possible, and I think we may see some people who are going to suggest that this is symbolic language of something. And so we'll see in our study video um, later how, how people read this. But this is much less ambiguous. This is language that calls for less interpretation as um, symbolism than what we have up here with a city Jerusalem descending from the sky. This is pretty clear language as far as Revelation goes that's quite straightforward. It's describing a reality where there is not pain, there is not death, and that God is living amongst his people. And this is very different than our current reality. This would require a whole new world. All right, continuing in verse 5. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write for, th- write for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give water to the one who thirsts, from the spring of the water of life without cost. The one who overcomes will inherit these things. Let's look at this. The one who overcomes will inherit these things. I think this is helpful in kind of telling us the meaning as well, right? This is, even if you're reading Revelation from a preterist point of view, describing most of the events and the kind of the prophetic elements being things that have already been completed, already happened in the past. So first century audience being told to endure persecution. There is an element here that even that audience of events which had happened in the past that this language seems to be describing a future outcome, a future real outcome for people who have been persecuted, that this is not something that's just happening here on earth in a natural way, that there is a degree of, um, how can I say, not spiritualized or metaphorical things going on here, but this is talking about something real that people will experience at a future time that is different than the current reality. Um. It is done. Uh, It's telling us here, I think this expression, it's done, is describing a completeness to it, something that's different, that we're in an ongoing process maybe, but at this it's talking about something which is complete. So, the one who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving, so cowardly probably has this um, the meaning of as they faced persecution, right? They, they like abandoned. So they were willing to trust God when it was easy, but they were cowardly in that they would abandon that when it became difficult or dangerous. So it's not referring to a general cowardice, like you're, you're afraid of skydiving or something. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable, what what is this mean? abominable um let's see what a different translation says um english standard version come on i wanted something easier let's where where is this abominable so verse 8 for the cowardly faithless the, they've translated this a little different faithless instead of unbelieving the detestable 
Okay. So, abominable, detestable. Let's try one more translation. New International Version. Perfect. So let's go down to verse 8. But for the cowardly, the unbelieving... Oh, look at this. The NIV and the New American Standard Bible are matching up. The vile. All right, so we have three different English words that are all trying to capture this one idea. Abominable, which I think is the coolest, but sounds too much like a snowman. Um, The detestable, which is a great word. And the vile, which... I think we get the meaning, right? The people who are living immoral, um, really like lives that you would look down on as being inappropriate and wrong. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and sexually immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death. And so we've seen some of this already in the judgment. And so this is referencing back to this, and it's contrasting in this new world that God is creating. It is a world that is created for those who have faith in God. That the way that you are part of this new world is through faith in God. And by contrast here, we have this picture um, of those who have abandoned God, who have chosen not to have faith in God, like they've gone the other direction. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Here, um, we we obviously have the Lamb is a symbolic reference to Jesus. Jesus. Um, And I think similarly, we can be pretty clear that the bride, the wife, is also a richly symbolic meaning. And um, we know from previously in Revelation that this is going to be the new Jerusalem, which he's just seen come down. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like, and I think this may explain, and this is, again, like a, it's re-saying the thing we've already heard. It's describing the event that we read in the first few verses a second time. Her brilliance was like a very valuable stone, like a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and the gates 12 angels, and the names were written on the gates, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the Son of of Israel. Now we're having more description of the city itself, and these are pretty richly symbolic um, in their meaning. There were three gates on the east and three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Earlier in Revelation, we talked about the 24 elders, and we have an interesting kind of um, way of referencing back to that right now. We have two sets of 12. This first set of 12 is about the tribes of Israel. The second set of 12 is about the 12 apostles of Jesus. And it's likely that this is indicating what John would have meant or what um, God would have revealed with the idea of 12 elders. And that is this picture, and we're seeing it throughout Revelation, that there are references to Israel and Judaism that seem to be linked very closely with the Christian church. That in the eyes of John and in the eyes of God who is revealing this, that the church and Israel are deeply connected, and that you can talk about Israel at this stage in history synonymously with the church, right? That the church is the true Israel. The church is the true people of God, and that this has expanded from its kind of ethnic meaning in the Old Testament to a new meaning in the New Testament. And you see that right here, that Jerusalem is made up of the New Testament apostles, as well as the Old Testament tribes of Israel. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. All right, so we're seeing another reference here to measuring. We've seen this earlier in Revelation. This time it's a gold measuring rod. 
The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length, width, and height are equal. Um, sounds like an element of kind of perfection and completeness that everything is as it should be. And he measured its walls, 144 cubits, by human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. Nice. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like the clear glass. Um, these sound like richly symbolic descriptive terms and numbers to me, um, that he has seen all of this, and it is saying something quite symbolic in its meaning. The foundation of the stones of the city wall were decorated with every kind of precious stone. All right, I started reading these stones. I had no idea how to pronounce most of them, so I went like in Google, and I like looked how to pronounce these things. So I'm going to try reading this again. If you're a stone expert, please do not be offended by my pronunciation. The first foundation stone was jasper. The second, sapphire. These are not the hard ones. The third, oh, crud. I just forgot how to pronounce it. Chalcedony? Chalcedony? Okay, I'll say it like that. The first foundation stone was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, chalcedony. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, sard. Sardonyx, the sixth Sardius, the seventh Chrysolite, the eighth Beryl, the ninth Topaz, the tenth Chrysophrase, Chrysophrase, the eleventh. Oh, I looked these up and I can't remember. J Jacinth, Jacinth, Hasinth. <laughs> I do not know how to pronounce any of these. The eleventh Jacinth. The twelfth amethyst. All right, so that was all the stones. I do not know what all of these look like. Um, it's possible that each one has its own deep meaning, and we could spend some time looking that up. It's clear that at a minimum, it's describing these like beautiful, um, like structures and what they are. And you know, as we've had this idea of the the shining splendor and glory and perfection of God's new city, of God's new dwelling with his people, that all of that is present in here. And the image might be a bit richer if you understand what these stones are or how they're used, but we're not going to do that right this second. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And this is the image that we often think of when we think of heaven, right? That the streets were made of gold. Interestingly enough, I don't actually think that pure gold looks like transparent glass. So it's, it's hard to imagine what this looks like. Maybe because I don't know what transparent glass looks like back then. But I think of like solid gold, which does not look like modern day transparent glass. My guess is all of this description is less literal and more symbolic. Um, I don't think the point of this is to give us a physical description of heaven. I think this is describing symbolically um, and providing meaning to the, the new world that God is creating, what that will be like. I saw no temple in it. Interesting. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And this is powerful, right? That in the Old Testament, a temple was necessary. But it is in Jesus, in our ability to be in relationship with Jesus, that we can experience, you know, oneness with God. And what's interesting here. I could imagine that some people would interpret this statement, no temple in it, for the God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, is describing current, is describing the current life of the believer. That as believers, we're already living this. Because we don't have a temple, we have Christ dwelling in our hearts. So up here, as we saw this idea of um Every tear being wiped away, there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning, crying, or pain. We know we have those things now, so it's hard to apply this statement um, to our current situation. That seems like something that we couldn't apply. By contrast, this, I saw no temple in it for the Lord, God Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple, we could very easily describe to the current life of a believer. The city has no need for the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. Um, obviously, 
um, we can apply that literally. Um, you could, I suppose, kind of apply that as a symbolism of this sentence about no temple. The nations will walk by its light. It's interesting you have this idea of the nation still. There's still this idea of separation of nations. Um, the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In fact, I'm going to change this to yellow. So this is actually raising questions. Um, it is red. That's why I had marked this as red because it was a question. But I think it's a question precisely about... <laughs> I don't, sometimes I have a hard time highlighting in Bible Gateway. Um, it's a question that's about the meaning, right? So it's hard to imagine that the first part that talks about no death would apply to our current state. But it's also hard to imagine that a future new earth with a new world where God is ruling in a literal sense, so if this is literal, not symbolic, would continue to have nations and would continue to have kings. And so in this, in this chapter, we can see two elements that provide a little bit of, um, how would I say, tension in the interpretation. This section here seems to be describing something that would make more sense in our kind of current age, right? That this is a symbolism of what happens when the gospel gets into the world, right? When the gospel arrives, when we place our faith and trust in Jesus, right? When, when we have a nation that is has the gospel at work in it, there's no need for a temple because God is dwelling among us. And that when we do that, when people are living this way, the nations will walk by the light of God. All right, let's keep reading and then we'll wrap it up. The nations will walk by its light, God's, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, into the light of God, in the daytime, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed and they will bring glory and honor of the nations into it. This sounds pretty symbolic to me. Um, it's entirely possible that, you know, in God's new kingdom, in God's new heaven and earth, there would no longer be darkness, but it seems more of a symbol for, um, for evil, for doing what's wrong, for um, following the wrong path than it does of actual, like um, the idea of whether or not the earth rotates in a way that we have night and uh, day. And they will bring glory and honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose name are written in the Lamb's book of life. All right, so this is tricky, and this is like why Revelation is so difficult to interpret. So that even when you narrow it down to asking a question, is this talking about a literal thing or a symbolic thing, you have things that support both positions in the same chapter. And you have different parts of the chapter that support each position a little more or a little less. And so it's going to be interesting as we do a more deep dive on this in the upcoming Bible study to see kind of the strengths of both positions and weigh them out. But that, but that is the challenging aspect of Revelation. It's all of the arguments... Like, so each of the different interpretations is backed up by something. It's not like you have these opposite views, and they both have a strong case sometimes. And so as we've looked through this, that's been one of the things that has really stood out to me in my reading of this, is even in my first read, without hearing the case from, like, you know, um, from the supporters of one position, it was clear to me that there was evidence within the text for more than one different position. And that makes interpretation harder. Well, that is it for today. Um, go ahead and keep reading on into chapter 22 as well to wrap up the book. And I'll see you in the next video for a detailed breakdown, still from that same book, Revelation 4 Views, but this time looking particularly at the two ways to interpret this section, the more literal or the more symbolic. We'll see you then, and God bless.